Now, I want you to imagine the scene. Mid-June 2005, I'm 13. I'm stood in the middle of a small market town near where I live in North Yorkshire. It's a Sunday evening, and it's getting late after a scorching summer's day out with my parents. Suddenly, dark clouds start gathering, and the sky turns an ill shade of green. Thunder rumbles around the market square, and the heavy rain starts to fall. This was going to be one of the worst floods on record to hit Northern England, but little did I know at the time but I was at the centre of it. After driving a few miles out of town on the way home, we realised that we could go no further. We were stuck. Water gushed down the hill slopes at the side of the road and brought tons of mud with it, with torrential rain lashing the car. This blocked the road in front of us, and my initial childhood excitement of the event soon turned to fear. Several more roads were blocked by floods, and I realised the scale of the unfolding event. Eventually, along with some other families and the help of a local farmer, we managed to find a small road home which is unaffected by the flood. On the news coverage late that evening, I remember seeing the damage and the catastrophic consequences to the community. And then, a scientist came on and said that because of climate change, the frequency and the severity of extreme weather events like these would increase. And this is where I recognised climate change was a part of my life, and I decided to do something. Now, last October, I gave a TEDx presentation at the O2 in London to an audience very much like yourselves. In that talk, I discussed how climate change has become this distant and this scientific concept. We still perceive climate change to be scientific, and the most common words we use to talk about it show this. Carbon dioxide, water vapour, greenhouse effect, global warming, and this is very disconnected from our everyday lives. Talking about climate change from a scientific point of view can be problematic because it's removed from our day-to-day -day lives. And why is this a problem? Well, what we need to do... Sorry, um, there's a scientific barrier to talking about climate change. People are fearful of talking about it, forgetting the science wrong. And why is that a problem? It's because it disencourages people from connecting to it. What we need to do is ground it in everyday life. Where we are at the moment, we all superficially care about climate change. We are prepared to do the simple things. I'm sure you've switched off your life to save energy, drive a little less, recycle. But most of us are unprepared to make the real changes to make emission savings. So, what we need to do is talk about climate change as an everyday concept. Talk about how extreme weather events on the other side of the world might be affecting you, yes, you, right now. Climate change is already, and it will continue to affect our daily lives from the direct ways such as sea level rise and extreme weather but also in the more indirect and the subtle ways, such as increasing food prices, food security, health issues, insurance. And these are all important issues that we need to be discussed. Climate change needs to be reclaimed from science and grounded back in the reality of everyday life. So, where do we go from this? Well, for me, that reminder that climate change is an everyday concept came in those floods. I've again seen the very visible impact of climate change on my travels around the world. 
I've seen the catastrophic melting of glaciers in Iceland and the European Alps. I've seen the changing rainfall patterns across Africa. And I've coughed through the smog in Beijing as a result of unregulated emissions. But we need to realize that not everyone will travel and see these changes firsthand. And that brings me to cities, one of the topics of today. Now, in 2008, this planet reached a tipping point when more people live in these urban spaces than don't. We are now an urban species. And that rate of urbanization is set to increase. And in 2013, the UN Human Settlement Programme estimated that by 2050, urban populations will double. The 19th century was a century of the empire. The 20th century was the century of the nation. The 21st century looks to be the century of the city. And when we live in these urban city lives, it's all too easy to become disconnected from the natural world around us. Cities are the ultimate embodiment of urban life, thriving masses of people, interacting, going to work, whizzing on trains or cars. We buy our supplies essential for life from small inner city shops. And we entertain ourselves through indoor activities, probably centered around some type of screen. In these lives, we don't directly and consciously interact with nature. The closest most of us come to talking about nature on a daily basis is talking about the weather, and that really doesn't change much. We are so disconnected from the natural world, which provides the essentials for city life, from the clean air we breathe, the water we drink, the energy which fuels this lifestyle, and the materials we build with. Now, climate change is a problem with a natural system. So no wonder that so many of us think of it as a problem which affects someone else, but not you, when we live in this way. Now, I had a fantastic conversation with a farmer from Leicestershire in England a few weeks ago, and he told me how he perceived the climate to be changing. He talked about the changing wind patterns and rain in central England. And he knew these things not because he had studied climate science, but because he interacted with the natural world on a day-to-day -day basis. He understood how it changed. We can learn from this. We need to view our cities not as in a bubble, they're not isolated systems. We need reminders that we are intimately connected from the nat to the natural world. Once we realize that the natural world affects us and we affect it, then we can move towards meaningful action on climate change. But how do we move past this disconnect? Well, I believe the city spaces themselves can give us some ideas. Now, I believe cities around the world can learn a tremendous amount from the Dutch culture, so you should be very proud of that. In the Netherlands, there is a culture which is intimately connected to the management of the natural environment. Obviously, this comes from your relationship with water and coastal management. In Zwolle, part of your everyday life might be seeing the flood defences. You might walk past them on your way to work, or you, maybe you can see them from your home. And this is very important because it acts as a reminder in your city life that nature is there. Now, in other cities around the world, in particular the UK and the US, I believe that urban wildness can offer this reminder. What do I mean when I say urban wildness? I mean green spaces within cities. But I use the term wildness not to simply mean the heavily managed and manicured places within cities, like the moored lawns or the flowers outside of posh hotels. These spaces should surprise. It's where nature shouldn't be. They should be intriguing and odd, and perhaps on the first instance, bizarre. 
And that's what I'm wearing today. You can see the classic sort of the corporate urban view coming through. And then you see the wellies. They seem odd and they contrast to that. That's what these spaces should seek to do. Now, you've already heard today about the fantastic physical benefits of gardens, including city, including space in cities, air quality, and including nature. But these spaces are far more than that. They can act as therapeutic spaces and help alleviate stress. But they can also act as these powerful reminders of the natural world and encourage us to think about it in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, a few years ago, I set up my own social enterprise, Roots, which develops eco-gardens from unused urban space. And this tries to include this element of surprise and wildness. I encourage people to interact with nature, either through the development of the garden, through getting your hands muddy and getting stuck in, or interacting with the final design in your everyday life. I've developed these across Northern England. My most recent venture was in the historic grounds of Durham University, where a garden now represents part of the everyday student experience. Now, to scale up these ideas of wildness, we must look to a project in New York, the High Line. This fantastic project has transformed a derelict urban railway into an aerial greenway. As you can see, the presence of nature up there seems surprising and odd. And the importance of this space is far more than a place to sit and relax. It can be used as a pathway to get across the city. New Yorkers can spend a few minutes each day in their journeys around the city to go through this. And as you can see, it seamlessly blends the heritage of the area, the railway in this case, with um, 210 species of rugged urban plants. The project is still expanding and it's seeking to transform the two and a half kilometer viaduct in the next few years. Now, just being introduced to the team for this exciting new project, which I'm involved in now, the Garden Bridge Trust in London, which will transform the centre of the city by 2018. This magnificent pedestrian bridge spans the River Thames and offers a garden. This will place a wild space within the heart of the city and enable people to do exactly that, same as the High Line, to interact with nature on a day-to-day -day basis as they cross the city in their lives. Just check out this classic London skyline viewed from within the wilderness. Fantastic. Now, these spaces must constantly reinvent themselves. They cannot be allowed to blend into the urban landscape. They must be reinvented, and they must always surprise the challenges to think about nature. And that's important. I've seen, in recent years, surprising projects such as 15-metre-high walls of vegetation in restaurants. Roofs are being reclaimed around the world by rooftop terraces, balconies of hotels, architecture which includes elements of nature. And these are exciting projects. Now, cities, again, one of the topics for today, can be fantastic engines for collaboration, for efficiency and sustainability if they're planned in the right way. By changing the space of the city itself, we can change mindsets, and that's where the real power is. We don't just need to change sustainable cities, we need to be sustainably minded. Now, green spaces in cities are all very well and good and exciting to look at. But I want to give something to you, something which you can do today, and to change your mindset. As I've said, you can explore the wilderness without leaving the city. But in fact, you don't have to go anywhere. You can reconnect with nature and the wildness through your mind. Try this very simple exercise when you go home. Just think for a minute about the natural world 
and view things and recognize them as resources. The next time you turn on that tap, imagine the journey that water has come on and appreciate it as a natural resource. It could have flowed from snow melt or one of the highest peaks of the European Alps along mighty raging rivers into your home. When you buy fruit or food at the supermarket, appreciate that it wasn't grown by the shop. It was imported for you and grown in far distant places. And when you switch on that light or drive your car, just think a little about the emissions that's causing and how it's contributing towards climate change. Reconnecting with the world, natural world in this way is the first step to cross that threshold of action towards meaningful action on climate change. We need to recognize how nature affects us and how we affect it. Go on, rediscover nature, be empowered, and find your wild side. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.